Right. Uh, welcome everyone to our first lecture in the Introduction to Programming with R course. Uh, my name is Marcelo Ponce. I hope that you guys can see me. Um, I'm going to take a few minutes to just uh, chat a little bit to give time uh, to everyone to join uh, either the meeting or the chat room in the course website. Um, we have uh, a variety of different technologies uh, going on at the same time. Um, I think I mentioned this in, in the previous emails. Um, uh, and so we have the, the Zoom meeting, which you probably guys are seeing. We have uh, the YouTube channel. Uh, yeah, thank you for from posting that, Dorna. Um, the YouTube channel is also embedded in the chat room from uh, the education website. Um, and then, of course, after class, we will have the recording of the lecture. Um, Again, if you experience any type of um, technical difficulties like sound not playing nicely or video not playing nicely, please try to let me know as soon as possible so I can try to see what can I do in order to, um, to fix that. Right, as I say, I'm going to, to uh, just try to give some, some few minutes to, for everyone to join the, the class. I will like to stay usually sharp but if you have been at u of t um you know there is this tradition of starting 10 minutes after the hour we can try to to um to keep that tradition going so um it's up to to you guys if you want to start sharp at the hour or 10 minutes after i, I don't basically care um but just let me know in the comments what would you prefer um the other thing is I'm planning to use Zoom for this. So far is the only way we had this kind of two way communication thing going on. Um, so um, perfect. It looks like everyone, so at least some of you are preferring to Sharp. That's great. That's great. That's really fine with me. Um, yeah, for the office hours, what I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to go much uh, more in detail in a in, in few minutes, is uh, to complete a survey uh, uh, that is open after the end of the, of the class today until uh, midnight today. Uh, when would you prefer to hold the office hours, uh, which day and time? And the options I have in mind uh, are, uh, so it could be just one day or split them in two days. Uh, so the days I have in mind is Mondays and Wednesdays, and I don't exactly recall the time slots I wrote there, but I think it's the same time at the uh, as the class. But again, that's that's um, we 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 can take a look at that as well. Okay. Uh, let me see. So we are one of four. So I think I'm going to to start with. Um, with the with the material, I think we have a few more folks. Yes. Welcome, Francis. Um, and as I say, if you if you have questions, please um, uh, let me know. Okay, I will try to monitor things so things may go uh, a little bit slowly, at least the first time. Okay, so let's go um, to the slides. I hope that you guys can see my slides, otherwise please uh, let me know. By the way, because we are recording and I'm trying to keep an eye on everything, uh, you may see the chat uh, in the recordings. So just to let you aware, is, is we cannot have like, you know, privacy, complete privacy and, and this kind of communication. Um, so your names and, and your comments may show up in the in the um, in the recordings okay we try to uh, keep privacy as, as much as possible but you you probably should be aware uh, of that okay so again welcome everyone my name is Marcelo Ponce I'm going to be the instructor for for this course I work at Signet uh, which is maybe some of you know or, or don't is the supercomputer center at the University of Toronto 
So we host uh, the largest and fastest supercomputing in the country, available for researchers and academics to, to run different kind of, um, of um, research based on, on computations. So a um, little bit about this class. So this class is, aims to be an introductory course uh, to programming and, and the language that we are going to be using is R. But my hope is that um, the, the techniques that you're going to learn can be transferred to any other uh, programming language. We are going to be meeting for the next uh, six weeks, uh, twice per week, Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, starting today, of course, uh, from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Because the, the current situation we are, we are living, uh, this class will be completely online. Um, and some elements I have to tell you we have been using since since long time ago in our courses, like the recording, and you will see all the all the technology and um, and tools available in the course website have been there since really long time. So some things are not really new for us. Others we have been playing a little bit in in the last uh, week uh, weeks and, and months. For approving the course, you will have to submit uh, six assignments. At least that's the original plan. Um, we will see how this goes, depending on, on, on the questions that you may have and, and so on. Um, but the idea is to have one assignment per week. And then the, the first assignment is going to be presented this Thursday after the class. And you will have one week to work in the assignment. And we can go much more in detail to that. But the final grade will be the average of these six assignments, and you have to submit all of them uh, in order to approve the course. I usually recommend that you submit the assignment in time. So the, 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 uh, um, the strategy you wish that we have is a present assignment on Thursday. You have one week to, to submit the assignment, and that's the deadline next Thursday. But if for whatever reason you, you cannot uh, submit the assignment on time, we give you one more week, but at half point penalty per day late. So after that first week, you will start losing half point out of 10. So I really encourage you uh, to try to keep up with the assignments. First of all, first of all because it will help you assimilate and, and, and put in practice uh, the concepts we are going to be discussing in class. But also, it's a way to don't lose marks. Um, the submission of the assignment is through the class website. And we're going to, throw, to go through those details on Thursday, so you don't have too much information to, to digest today. I mentioned this at the very beginning. Office hours will be online as well. Um, my idea is Mondays or Wednesdays. And I, I have an, a survey, uh, it, it shows up as a test in the course website, and it will be open after uh, the class end today until midnight today. So you can select, uh, I think there are six, six options there, you can select the one that fits better with your schedule. If you have any questions uh, that you want to ask, either about the class material that we cover, or about the topics that we will cover, anything related, please uh, email me. Uh, I want to show you other tools that you can use, but if you want to have a, a, a direct communication, just email me at courses at signet.utoronto.ca. Just to let you know, one of the things that we usually see in this type of courses uh, is that after a while, after even the course finished, we have students coming back to us asking questions about how to analyze data, how to program things. And in some cases, we have really interesting discussions and really interesting collaborations where we are able to actually um, even write papers or do some research together. So by all means, I know this is a very uh, a strange situation, the one that we are living nowadays, but I really encourage you to, to you know, email us any kind of questions that you may have. Uh, you received this information from, um, from my previous email. Um, that's, the, that's the course website. All what is related to the course will be there. That's a short, uh, short uh, link there, signup.courses slash 526. 
you already know this because you are either in the in the Zoom meeting or in the chat in the website. We will have these two ways of, of streaming the um, the lectures. The lectures, as I mentioned at the beginning, will be recorded and posted on the course website. So again, be aware of that. The slides of the lectures will be posted in the course place website at least the day before the lecture. So you have the chance to review the material, especially in this, uh, this online format, I would encourage you that you take a quick peek at the material. If you notice something that, uh, that can be of um, interest for you or something that you think it may not be clear enough, we are going to go through all the material, but you know, you, you can just have a, a, a quick overview of it. Um, I think I mentioned this, office hours will be online as well. Uh, most likely using uh, Zoom. Uh, now be aware that the office hours will not be recorded. The idea there is that you guys have questions, uh, you are working in the assignments or you have questions about the material we cover in the lectures and, and, and I will expect you to be the main um, actors there and I will just try to address your questions. I have my, my email again here courses at sign at utoronto.ca. Of course, you receive my, my emails from my personal address. You can either write to any of those. I prefer the courses at sign at .utoronto because it's a way to aggregate all the information for me about the course. And in some cases, I have colleagues that can also help answering uh, the questions that you may have. Also, please let me know if I'm going too fast. Um, uh, I want to mention this uh, uh, as well because this is something uh, quite um, quite interesting. You all of you are taking this course uh, as part of your graduate uh, degree uh, at the Department of Biochemistry. But in addition to getting the the credits for this course, you will also get what we call signed credits. And what we have assigned is a certificate program. So basically we can, um, we will issue a certificate after your 10, 36 signer credits. And we have three types of certificates. Uh, one is in data science, one is in scientific computing, and another one on high performance computing. So depending, um, depending on, um, so depending on which courses you take, um you may get credits um on this on these different parts for instance i believe this course has credits going uh, nine credits to the data science certificate and nine credits going to the scientific computing certificate i had someone saying laura claiming that she can see the slides changing is this happen to everyone Ooh, okay. Um, hmm. Let me see. Okay, I think that happens when. So let me see if I can fix that. Okay, you should be able to see. This. Yeah, so the thing with YouTube, so these are, as I mentioned at the beginning, and I apologize um, for that, is we had a couple of different technologies going on. So Zoom is, is a program that allow you to do this kind um, uh, of meeting and, and, and conferencing. And at the same time, I had another uh, streaming service going to the YouTube channel. But I think the problem was because I was bringing different screens to the front. Now I think you should be able to see my slides changing. Um, so I was talking about the sign certificates. Um, okay, I think I fixed that now. Please let me know otherwise. So as I was saying, the class uh, will also give you, when you complete the class, it will give you actually 18 credits, nine towards the data science certificate and nine towards the scientific computing certificate. Um, what else? Uh, if you want to know more about that, please visit our, our courses website. We have a, usually, I should say, we have a great variety and a long list of courses because the, the current situation, this has been, uh, let's say, put in pause for the moment. Uh, but hopefully when things go back to normal, we will come back with way more courses so you can complete your, your certificates uh, credit. 
if you are interested in that, by the way. And, and I have to tell you, uh, again, our, our previous students, even people that have graduated and are postdocs, they, they had told us that these are really great for finding jobs either in, in academia, uh, doing research, or even in the, in the industry. So it's something to, to keep in mind. And this comes for free as a parallel thing to, to, the, to the graduate course uh, that you are taking right now. Um, so, what are the classes expectation? Okay, so the the prerequisites are basically none. Uh, I would say uh, the, we have minimal to no programming experience. Uh, so the goal here is that we're going to start really slowly, and we will try to to build up uh, upon things. Um, Again, if you have some experience, it may be too slow for you at the beginning. So I, 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 I please ask you to be, to be uh, patient a little bit. I think we are going to cover very interesting things, but the first week probably is going to be a little bit boring if you have some experience. If you don't have any experience at all, please let me know uh, how do you feel about the, the pace that we are covering things, okay? If we need to spend more time here or there, that's, that's just fine. Um, of course, that usually is, is easier when we do it in person, but we will try our best to, to, to keep up with things, doing it uh, virtually. What programs, what software are you going to need? Okay, this is really important. You are going to need what we call a text editor or a code editor. And I have some suggestions here. Uh, Adam and Sublime are really good ones. Um, there may be other ones. The one I use personally is something very, very high level or low level, uh, it's BI, but these two are just fine. And if you install R, which is the other main element, of course, we're, we're going to need, um, R brings also some, some sort of code editor, so that will be just fine. I mentioned this, the gradient scheme is the final grade will be based on your homework assignment uh, and it will be the, the average of the six assignments which you must, you have to submit the six, the six assignments. Attendance is not mandatory, of course, uh, we're not taking uh, attendance right now, but I will say it's strongly encouraged. It can be during the lectures itself or it can be by watching the recordings later on, but I will encourage to do that. Um, okay, so if you haven't visited the, the class website, I probably all of you have done this by now. This is more or less how it looks like. So on the left, you have the main website. On the right, you have our own course website. Um, by now, you should have received your signed accounts. I believe that if you if you haven't, you, you probably are not going to be there because a lot of information goes through, through there. Um, but it's crucial that you can log in into the course website. So one thing that you're going to do verify today after classes by completing this this test this survey i ask you to select which is the best time for you for the office hours okay so i hope that everyone can do it and if anyone find any trouble please let me know okay this is um something i have to mention is, is part of the formality of the course about the student code of conduct and this is more uh, important even nowadays in, in this particular format of the course that is going to be online and what it basically says, what it basically boils down to say is don't copy code from each other. All your assignments are going to be submission of scripts and code that you should write your own. So please don't copy. Um, you are welcome to discuss even in, uh, maybe online with your colleagues. Of course, you, you will be able to do a Googling and, and searches online. I promise you all the material that you need to solve the assignments, to, to complete the assignments, will be within the lectures. So at the end of the day, if you are going to spend hours Googling for a solution online, you're going to be wasting your time. First of all, because it will take a good amount of time to find the right solution because we try to be really uh, creative with the assignments, so you won't be able to find that easily. Uh, and, and you will be basically wasting the opportunity to put in practice what you are learning. And of course, please don't don't copy the code from each other. That's, that's yeah. I, 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 as I say, it's more a formality than anything else. But please, don't do that. Okay. What we are going to cover in the class, and we're almost taking uh, one third of the class. I'm going to try to finish this introduction very quickly is um, we're going to, of course, discuss the, the R language. 
we are going to discuss data structures, what, what type of, of data you can store in R, but we are going to discuss also some basic um, programming strategies and concepts like modular programming and modularity. We have, it's, it's a must if you are learning R to discuss some statistics because R is a language aimed for statistics. Then we are going to come back to some basics of computing like file input and output. We are going to discuss some visualization. And then even when this is a very short course, we may have some freedom to pick some different topics that you may want to cover. And among the topics are, of course, we can do some more statistics, for instance, machine learning. We can do some high performance computing with R. Or if you have any particular topic that you would like to cover uh, or to see cover, please let me know. We, we, as I say, we may have some freedom in order to to try to you know accommodate the, the needs and the interests of, of, of you guys okay so for starting the actual class let me check i don't think i have any questions in, in any of the chats um, for starting the actual class what we are going to discuss today is an introduction to r how to start R, the primitive data types that r offers and container types and so these are the very basic blocks uh, for starting to know how to actually instruct the computer to do what we need to do, because that's that's all what it is about programming. Okay. Okay. I think that we are fine. Again, if you have any questions, please. Uh, I think you have a feature in Zoom. Raise your hand uh, if you want to speak up or or just put the questions in the chat. So let me start with the very basic. What is a computer pro? Okay, so a computer program is nothing else than a set of very precise instructions that tell the computer what to do. Okay, so it's, it's like a recipe for, for doing something in, in the kitchen. You need to follow these precise instructions and that is what the computer is going to do with, with our computer program. Uh, what that implies, but well, generally speaking, and especially in scientific computing, I would say you basically define some variables which will be where you store the data and you perform some of this data and do some calculations and then you, you, you share the result uh, with the user. So I'm using here the word variable and, and when I mention variable in, in programming, what I want you to think about is a place in the memory of the computer when you can store different type of data of, of values. Um, the next word I mentioned here is functions, and functions are like procedures. I, I can define my own functions um, and then apply what are the elements of this function to the data that I have stored in the memory of the computer. And the nice thing of this is that you can reuse over and over these, these functions with different values, with different variables that you pass the, the, into the functions. There are a lot of programming languages um, with different strengths and different weaknesses. Uh, the one that we will be using for this class is R, uh, and they had some re there, is some, there are some reasons why to do that. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the, the story of R. So it has been around for a while. Uh, it started by being what was called at that time the S language, and then it was renamed to, to R. R is especially designed for exploring and analyzing data in particular and, and, and most of the statistical things that you may want to do with the data are already part of the R core package or, or uh, uh, develop it in, in, in libraries. So it's, it's very well suited for any kind of a statistical analysis of uh, kind of problem. The home page for, for R is, is this URL right here. And then what it has is a great variety of packages, additional packages and libraries also are called that you can find in what is called CRAN, the Comprehensive R Archive Network, or Bio, Bioconductor, which is the main um, archive for bioinformatics. A new version of R is released every year. We are actually using version 363, so that's the, the currently one uh, right now. I got an interesting question uh, before the, the beginning of the class um, by one of you, and I, find, and I think it's, it's, very, um, it's a really good thing to mention as well. 
You don't need to be in the last version. All the code and things I'm going to show you should work with previous versions and I usually try to keep it that way on purpose because being at the bleeding edge of the latest versions also implying that you are subject to new bugs that sometimes it's hard to, to debug, to find new problems that you, it's hard to find uh, when you are in a bleeding edge. Actually, the, the version, the pre-release version 4.0 is also available to download from now. I, I strongly encourage don't do that unless you really want to, to practice and, and try the new things that they are planning to develop for R. So version 3.6.3 or any version up to 3.5 something should be okay, all right? So a little bit more about R. R is what we call a scripting language. So if you are familiar with the Linux shell or with Python, uh, it's the same idea. So it means that when you open R, you will have uh, a prompt, meaning that the computer will, wait, will be waiting for you to introduce commands and R will understand, will interpret these commands one at a time after you hit enter. R can be used interactively with or without an IDE and I take the opportunity to mention here RStudio. Many of you may be using or are familiar with RStudio. I won't be using RStudio but you are welcome to do that. I, I teach another course in the fall uh, where we actually ask students to don't use our studio because one of the main disadvantages of our studio is that you lose something called command line arguments. And that is the possibility of communicating into your R programs information coming from the outside world through the command line. We are not going to cover this in this course because of the, of the, of the time we have. We have just six weeks. Uh, but that is a, is a weak point with RStudio. Having said that, RStudio offers uh, an integrated development environment, that's, that's what IDE stands for, and it's very nice if you are starting from for the first time uh, programming. So in this case, if you, if you would like to use RStudio, that's, that's just fine with me. Uh, R can be also used non interactively running uh, scripts, so we're going to see a little bit of this in lecture four, I believe. Um, R has a large repository of community package. Those are the ones coming from either CRAN or Bioconductor. And nowadays you can also install packages available in GitHub. Um, as I, I mentioned, this R is all about data analysis. So it's not a really general purpose language, um, but several important features like numerics, visualization are part of the, of the language itself. Um, and R is also designed uh, with the idea of doing a lot of interactive data exploration or manipulation. So surprising things just work interactively. So we're going to see examples of this probably next class. Um, now, one thing that to bear in mind, and I have mentioned this term two times now, bug. So bug, it refers to when you have a flow, uh, a, pro a problem in your program that of course you are not aware of. So finding those problems within your code can be a little bit tricky in an environment like this. But don't worry, we're going to, to discuss some, some um, techniques in how to mitigate this. It's almost impossible to, to write a code without bugs. It's by definition, your code always has bugs. So all you can do is try to follow best practices so that you can mitigate or, or have good tools to try to, to investigate and find these bugs. So starting out, so if you, if you are, um, you, you can follow along this part of the class, in particular if you have already installed R, if not, you can come back to the slides and, and, and follow later on. But you, if you install R, basically, you can just, independently of the operating system, you can basically find the, I, the R icon, double click on it, and, and a new window will pop. What I usually do, I, I, I like to do actually, is open a terminal. In particular, that's how it is called in, in Mac OS, or if you are in Linux, or if you are in Windows, I believe nowadays they have a Ubuntu subsystem that allow you to do that. But if not, if you want to try that, you, you can email me and I can send you some information on how to do that. It doesn't matter how you do it. The important thing is that you can start out just by double clicking on the icon, okay? And if you do that, let me see if I can switch my share screen here. So I'm going to try to share. Um, 
So you should be able to see a terminal now. And a little bit. I hope the font size is good enough. So I'm in, in Mac OS in this case, and I'm going to just type R. And again, this may be different depending on the operating system that you are using. If you are using Windows, this won't work. If you are using uh, Linux, uh, you probably just open a terminal, whatever terminal you use, and just type R. And I'm going to type R and hit enter. And this is what, what it shows up. So this is the welcome screen from R. It says R version 353. That's the one I'm using in this case. Uh, and now you see this greater than symbol with a blinking cursor. So that's it from. Okay. So I just wanted to, to show you how to open R in the terminal. If not, if you double click on the R icon below, uh, should have pop up in your computer right now. It can be that it looks a little bit different, but more or less, uh, with the with the exception of the of the version uh, and some of the text here, it should look more or less the same. Okay. So let me go back to my slides. Okay. So. We talk about this greater than symbol, that's, that's the prompt, means R is waiting for you to uh, put instructions. So let's take a look. So what I have here on the right are examples. So what I'm saying here is I'm typing the character A, and then this uh, kind of arrow thing pointing to the left is nothing else than uh, the smaller than symbol dash, or the minus sign, and it says A uh, smaller than dash one. What it means is I'm putting, I'm creating, I'm putting in a variable called a the value of one. So this this uh, left arrow, which you mean, if you wish, is is uh, the what we call the assignator operator. So we are telling our okay from now on, when I say a, you need to give me the value that is stored in a, and in this case is is the number one. Okay, so I do I can type a this thing uh one a and if you type a you will say a has the value of one um similarly i can use this other expression where i say a assigned to a the value of a plus one so what happened here is the right hand sign is evaluated first so r looks first at this part where it says a plus one because a has the value of one as we assigned it before now, a plus one is two, and that is assigned again into the variable a. So if I say a and hit enter, r will respond with two, okay? Similarly, I can say a divided by two plus three. Now, if I ask this, a will say, if I ask what is the value of a, a r will say a is four, because a was two before, by two I get one, plus three, that's my four. Okay, so let me see if I have a question. Uh, handling questions. Can we use equal instead of uh, the left arrow? The answer is yes. My recommendation though is, is, uh, is no, for two reasons. Uh, reason number one, if you, if you go to, into the R community and the developers of R, is a recommendation they, they tell you don't use equal instead of the left operator. The second reason is, or there are two more reasons, and the full arguments for your functions. And we are going to see this next class. So, but these three, two or three reasons why I would recommend uh, not to use the equal operator, okay? Yes, the, the, so the another question, can I do something like a plus one assigned to a? Yes, but I find it a little bit confusing because after you, you get programming, you see that the usual flow is take whatever is on the right of the operator and, in, and, and store it on the left. I have seen code doing that thing, a plus one assigned to a. It does work. I wouldn't recommend doing that just because the, I have seen most of the code being written. So again, it, it may be a personal taste. Okay, great question. What is this bra what it means is that's the first value stored in A, okay? 
keep that question in mind. We're going to come in in few slides, okay? But I'm going to mention this this again uh, very quickly, okay? But that's is some uh, additional information R is returning to you in how the data is laid down inside the variable, inside the memory, okay? So let me go back to my slides. Um, let me see, I think, I think I'm, uh, Okay, we work, we talk about this. Okay, so let's say we have a value assigned to the variable A. Now I can use, so this type of uh, is a function that R provides, okay? Tells you what type of data is stored in that particular variable. So the name of the variable here is A, and if I write type of and parentheses, put the variable inside those parentheses, what it will return is what is the type of that variable. Okay, and this, by the way, is the usual way how we call fun. a function called type of, and whatever I want the function to use as the argument, as the information to, to perform the operation that the function does on, is, is uh, goes inside those parentheses. So in this case, type of variable A is double, which, is, which means it's just a type of number. So this is a number. And this is good because now I can perform, as we were seeing before, I can perform mathematic, mathematical operations with it. Here, for instance, what I'm doing is taking the type of result from the previous line and assigning it to the variable B. And now if I type B, it says it's double. But it says double between quotation marks. And this is an important difference. Now, there is another function that you can use. This is all, these are called diagnostic functions. And as is whatever goes inside the parentheses, a number, so is numeric parentheses A, and it says true. But if I ask is numeric of B, it will, it will say false, because B now is a string. It means that it's a collection of characters. It's basically text. I cannot perform the mathematical operations with text, with the strings. Okay. So, I think whatever is, is written here is more or less what I just mentioned. Um, okay, so there are a couple of interesting details here. When I use, when I call a function like here, if this is not assigned to a variable, what R does is just printing the screen the result, and that is where this bracket one comes from, actually. Um, similarly, when you assign uh, to a variable and then you type the variable, it's going to basically give you the same output, so the bracket one will be there. Um, some cases, um, in some cases, what you will notice is that the functions, for instance, the functions that we are using here, they return something. But in some cases, they won't need to return something. And that's something that we are going to, to see much more in detail in next class. Okay? Any questions so far? I, I keep in mind this bracket one thing, and I promise I will come back to that in a second. Okay? Now, let me, let me just um, do a quick parenthesis here about... Uh, the type of programming, and this is coming back to why R is an uh, interactive programming um, language. So basically what has happened before is whenever we have this prompt and we enter commands, R reads that instruction and executes things. And that's the output that you see when R interprets whatever that command, that function is, and the result is the output of, of interpreting that. But R, R can also be run by writing scripts. And what that means is we are going to put all these commands together in a text file, which then we can fit into R. R will read line by line and execute those lines as if you were typing them in the terminal. And this I can express how useful it is, because imagine that you have data coming from the lab, from an experiment, from a database, whatever and you have to perform a statistical analysis on the data many, many times, you won't be, or you don't want to be writing every time the same commands, or slightly variations of that, when you can have all those commands in a tiny script, in a tiny file, and say, okay, run all these commands on my data. It will save you a lot of time. It will avoid having typos when you type things. That's one of the annoying things with programming. One has to type things, and that usually implies having typos and, and, and bugs. 
So it will save a lot of time and the most important thing probably nowadays, it will allow you for reproducibility of results. So having this script is one of the main elements of this course and it's one of the main things that we are going to be evaluating throughout the course. Okay, so that's, that's one of the things I wanted to mention. Now, let's change the type of variable that we were discussing. We were discussing before numbers or numeric type of variables. Let's assign now to the variable e the word hello. Okay, and this is written with double quotation marks. Then I'm going to assign to the variable she the word war. And these two are strings. It's a collection of character, text in other words. Okay, now let me see. Yeah, okay, thanks Francis for that. Um, so what I'm going to do now, I told you I cannot perform arithmetic operations here. So if you do E plus E, R will tell you those are not the type of things I can add together. But what I, call, I can do is I can combine these two things. And this paste command is very useful. So paste is another function. So and, and you may see by now I'm sometimes using the word function or command um, as, as the same thing. And in some way it is function and command in R. So paste function or a command will take these variables e and she, which are separated by a comma, and the result of this is going to be stored in a new variable called my stream. So now if I use the function or command in our print, my stream, it will say hello world, which is the combination of these two strings. Alternately to print, which as you can see has the bracket one, you can also use cat. Cat is another function in R that what it does is it takes several strings and combine them together in one output. So in this case, cat is taking the variable e, which has hello, the variable she, which has war, and then this funny thing, single quotation slash n, single quotation. That's another string, but this is a special string because it has this symbol which represents a new line. So it means it's like hitting enter at the end. Otherwise, your prompt, if you don't include this, your prompt will be just next to the word hello. Uh, sorry, to the word hello world. Okay. Now, if we go back to our previous uh, type of function and we do it with e, now it says that the type of, of variable e is a character and it's not more a number. And as I was telling you, if you do e plus e, is R says, no, I cannot do that operation because these are non-numeric uh, variables. That's what's, what the mention, what the message mentioned there. Okay, I think I have um, another comment in the chat, let me see. Different between hello, double quotation, word. No, no different whatsoever, but you have to be consistent. So, and the reason why both work is because sometimes you may want to have text that has quotation marks inside. So if you want to have a text that has a quotation mark, a double quotation mark inside, then you will say, um, let me show you an example. You will say you start on single quotation marks and then um, you will say something like double quotation marks, uh, whatever you want to say. For instance, um, I'm going to say message is my variable and here I'm going to say, I'm going to start with single quotation marks and say welcome to, and I will to open BCH 2024, single quotation marks and close with, uh, sorry, double quotation marks and close with single quotation marks. So now if I do, uh, if, I, if I do message, now it says welcome to, and it has this funny uh, slashes, it's just the way that, that it's showing you, but you can do something like uh, cat message and the slashes are gone. And you can see what I was saying before. If I don't write the dash N at the end, my prompt is just next to the text that the cat function brought. So I can do cat message uh, dash N, and now, boom, the, the new line character is introduced by adding dash N here. So that is very helpful when displaying information in the screen. Now, another thing uh, that I also had, I think in the slides at some point is that if you want to reduce commands that you have written in the terminal, in the R terminal, you can use the up 
and down arrow. So I'm uh, pressing my, my up arrow now, and you can see I'm, I'm going through the history of commands I just brought in this session, okay? So that is very useful uh, because it avoids you to have to write things again if you are trying things especially, okay? So let's go back to the slides. Um, so we were doing the E plus E thing, okay? A good question. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so the, as, as we say, there are two, at least two types of variables that we have discussed so far, numbers and strings or text. And sometimes we, we shouldn't get confused with them. So A, we can reassign the value of one to A. B, we can assign the character, the letter X A. And if I type B, uh, if I type B, now it should say A. Now, if sign, and this can be a little bit uh, tricky, if I assign A to D, D now should have the value of A, because it's not the letter A stored in the variable B, but it's the value of A of A stored in the variable A. Okay, that makes sense? Just to, to uh, let you know about that. By the way, the choice of variable names I had done for this example is really, really bad. And the reason is, uh, well, it's the, the introduction, so I don't want to go into complicated variable names, but that is one of the, of the um, uh, things that we are going to cover, how to write code in an elegant and, and, and proper manner. So when you read the code, by just looking at the variable names, you can get an idea of what that variable represents. A, B, and D so far here means nothing. And you may be noticing I skipped the letter C on purpose, and there is a real good reason that we are going to come back to that, why I'm skipping that, okay? Third type of, of variable that we are going to discuss today is what we call Booleans, or logical variables. And uh, you, you have seen this one already when I asked the question, is A equal, by a, using the double equal sign, to a number, to a particular value? And R says true or false, depending on the question I was asking. Or is numeric or uh, is character, that's another function. So I can assign to the variable F again, very poor choice of variable names so far. Don't worry about that, this, this lecture at least. The value of false. And notice that false uh, has to be written all in capital letters. So this is another important thing with R. R is what we call case sense capital F and lowercase f are not the same thing for us. And in particular, the, the word false, which represents a particular code, a particular value, has to be all caps, okay, all capital uh, letters. So if I assign false to f and then I type f, I will say it's false. Now, if I want the opposite, and this only works with Boolean operators or Boolean logic, if you wish, I can then put exclamation sign in front of F, and now false converts into true, okay? If I use type of F, I will say, okay, this is not a number, this is not a character, this is a logical Boolean byte, okay? And of course, there is is logical function, which tells you if a, if a variable is a Boolean or logical, and in this case, it's true. Now, something funny that happens with Booleans in R, uh, and sometimes can be useful, is that you can add booleans. So I can add true plus true, and that give me two. And if I have another true here, it will be three. The reason is that R internally represents a false with a zero and a true with a one. So you can use this for actually asking questions. If, if we're going to see much more details on that, but just keep this in, in the back of your mind so far numeric strings booleans and booleans internally are represented in R as ones or zeros okay the exclamation sign here represents the not operator which basically reverse or, or converts a true into a false or vice versa okay so kind of a summary so far we have seen numeric types which include numbers basically don't worry about the names logicals which are booleans meaning true or false, and character strings that represents uh, text. Uh, this is the assign operator, as, as we mentioned, you, you realize that the equal operator works, I will uh, uh, advise not using that, 
but it works. Um, logical literals are shouty, as I like to say, so all capitals, or you can uh, short them by just T or F, but again, all uh, in capital letters. Variables can have periods in their names, and that is useful, especially when being explicit about what a variable means. Okay, um, this is super important, and we are going to to actually emphasize this a lot. Your scripts and your functions should have comments, and the comments start with the hashtag symbol or the pound number symbol. Uh, what it means is when you type that and you type whatever, are misregards that completely. But they are so important, are the hints, those are the explanations that the programmer leaves for another human being looking at your code. Okay, so those are going to be crucial in your assignments. You're going to be also uh, docket marked by not having them or not having clear comments. So we are going to, to spend some time talking about them uh, in next lecture. Okay. I mentioned this, R is what we call case sensitive. So capital A is not the same as lowercase a. Okay, sometimes sources of bugs here as well. One more thing on the technical side, R does what we call uh, dy dynamic typing. It means is, okay, I started by assigning uh, to the variable A, the number one, and if I ask what is A, then A is one. But right away I can say, okay, no, A actually will take the value of the string pants. And R will not doubt about it. It will just overwrite whatever was in, in, in the memory, in the, value, in the variable A, and it will write pants. And I can do true, I can convert into a Boolean. So that's what it means with dynamic uh, typing. Now, when you do this in another type of language, this won't work. Like in particular, if you do something um, in, a, in, in those type of languages that requires a compiler, not an interpreter, they will just crash your code while the compilation happens. So, I, I again, I will strongly advise against doing this. I just mentioned this because you may see codes written in this way. There could be some reasons for doing that, especially if you are dealing with very large data structures. In order to save memory, we may talk about this if you decide to do the HPC um, R class. But from the programming perspective, it's a really bad choice, I would say, because it can confuse the program, it can confuse the human being reading the programs. It is true that we write programs for the computer to perform those operations, but probably the most important part is the human being reading the program to understand what the program means, okay? Because that is the connection that has to be between the human being and the computer for the program to work properly. So again, this is possible, please don't do it, okay? It's, it's not a really good practice. Now, we are going to start very quickly uh, what we call the composite or container data types in R. And these are variables that can contain different types of variables. So we saw the numeric types before, we saw the text types before, we saw the Boolean. What about if I want to create a variable that has different types? Well, guess what? There is what we call the list, which is a container type that allow you to store that. So here what I'm defining is a variable called L. I assign an operator, the function is called list, and then I'm going to put there my previous variables, A, B, E, F, G, and actually the value pi. So the value pi, 314, blah, 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 is predefined in R. So by doing that, I define in a variable L. I can use another diagnostic function from R called str for the structure that will tell me what is the structure of this variable L, and what it's telling me is it's a list of six elements. The first one um, is a logic, a boolean. Second one is a character. So remember, A was in the last time was assigned the value true. Okay, that's why it's a boolean. The character uh, comes from the variable B, which was A. E was hello before, F was false, she was war, and then pi is a constant predefining R with the value of 314, blah, blah, blah. Similarly, I can use this is list diagnostic function to ask, is this variable a list? And R will return true because it is indeed a list. Okay? Again, super important, will be part of your first assignment, I think. Now, this comes back to the question of the bracket one. Remember some time ago you asked me about bracket one in the output? Well, 
um, R tries to tell you in the outputs if it is returning a simple or a native or a basic data type or a container or composite data type. And the way it does it is by this bracket notation. So when you use double bracket, you are accessing one element within the list. So if I do L bracket bracket six bracket bracket, it says bracket one, three, 14. That's the, the sixth element in the list, which is the value of pi. Now, I can do what is called a slicing. We're going to come back to this. It's a very powerful technique. I can do from the list, give me the elements one to three. So one column three represents elements one, two, and three. And what it's telling me is, okay, first element in the entry in the first entry is a true first element in the second entry of the list is the value of a third element of the um, of the list is the value hello so you can see that when our list you have double bracket when you have a single object or, or the type of object is one of these native types there is just one single bracket so in the previous output what I was telling you is that the output was a single uh, variable, one of these native type, basic type of variables, and not a list per se. Okay, so I hope that I can, uh, I, I could uh, um, clarify that, that question from before. Otherwise, let me know. Okay. Now, there is a, so that was the very uh, straightforward way of defining list. Um, there is another way you can define list, what is called named list, and again, this is super useful, and I think it's going to be again part of your first assignment. So in this case, I'm calling this named dot list. So that is where I can use periods in my variable names. So it says a variable name. I'm going to use the list function again, but now I'm going to say instead of the first element being just a variable, I would say value equal five. I could say value equal the name of the variable, word equal text, a number equal another name. If I ask for the structure of this object, now R says it's a list of three elements. The first one is called value and has the value of five. The second one is called word and has, it's a string and has the value of text. And the third one is a number, it's numeric, and has the value 7.3. More importantly, I can use this dollar sign notation to, us, to actually uh, get the actual value of the first element. So I can say name it dot list dollar sign value and I get the actual value of that spot in the list. I can alternately use bracket bracket notation as we saw before with the name as a string. So the quotation marks means I'm specifying the name of the spot in the list as a string. So if I say name it dot list my variable bracket bracket quotation mark number I will go and grab this value from here. Okay. Finally, I can say, give me the names of the elements in the list. So names in this case is a function that access the list and tell you if the, if the list has names. And in this case, it's returning value, word, and number. Okay. These techniques are also applied to what we call what, another composite data type, which is the data frame, okay. which is one of the key players in R. Okay. Vectors. So this is another another composite type in R. It's very similar to list, but the main difference between uh, uh, vectors and list is that vectors are homogeneous in type, meaning that they have all the elements in the vector have to have the same type. Okay. They cannot be listed, nested, so cannot contain a vector inside. At least, yes, it can contain a vector inside. And the way to create a vector, remember I told you I was avoiding to use the letter C as a variable name, is by using the C function, which combines different values into a vector or a list. So if I say A, C, 1, 2, 3, I'm going to be creating a vector with the values 1, 2, 3. If I say B, C, hello world from a vector, it will be creating a vector all from strings. Okay? And if I ask for the structure of P in this case, it will say is a vector of characters and then all the values in there. Okay? We're going to come back to vectors are really important and the reason for their existence is that they can optimize a lot of operations because the homogeneity of the types within the vector. So it can make things run way faster than when dealing with lists. Okay? But we're going to come back to that. Okay. 
almost almost at the end i know i'm running a little bit uh, longer in time but i will be done in five minutes i promise there are a lot of data sets i told you r is the niche the, or, or the niche of r is data analyzing data digesting data processing data however you want to think about that and one of the things that r brings alone is a lot of data sets already cooked inside r so you can use the data parenthesis parenthesis function and it will show all the all the pack, all the data sets that are part of that. Uh, you can pick your favorite, you can look at the structure of those data sets and it will give you information about that. If you are doing that, if you're doing the data thing, just press Q to get out of the data main. Okay. Data friends. This is the most relevant data structure that are holes and it's super, super important. You can think of a data frame as a spreadsheet. That's the main idea. Uh, we're going to spend almost one whole class talking about data frames, uh, but basically each column is like a, a list of vectors, or the data frame is a collection of lists of vectors. So each vector contains information, and you can access that information in a very similar manner as we did with the list. So for instance, I'm taking from that data sets that are has the, the one called trees, and I'm calling uh, referring to them as data so you can access it. So you, if I ask for the class of data, it's telling me, okay, this is a data frame. If I ask for the structure of data, it's telling me this is a data frame where there are 31 observations of three variables, which means it has 31 rows with three columns. And the columns are called girth, height, and volume. So these are measurements of, I, I believe, our orange data trees, uh, orange trees actually, where there is the girth of the, of the tree, the height of the tree and the volume of the tree. So you can see how those values correspond to each other. Again, we're going to come back to this. I just want to let you know because this is one of the composite types in R. In the same way that we can access the names of the, of the list, we can also access the names of the columns in the data frame. So I can say names of data and I will get girls, height and volume. Now, if I want to access the first three rows in the data frame for the column girth, I can take my data frame, use bracket, single bracket notation in this case, one to three will give me the first three rows from the column girth. So this comma means the first position are the rows I want to select from the data frame. The second position after the comma means which column I want. Okay, and what is returning is the three values stored in the column girls for the first three rows. I can also get different rows. I can get rows two, three, and five from the data set. And if I don't specify anything, I will return all the columns in the data frame. So data of the vector, what I'm doing here is I'm defining a vector to slice the data frame. Remember that word is super useful in R, super powerful and, and super efficient. Two, three, and five is my vector. So I'm going to get rows two, three, and five, and all the columns because I'm not specifying which column I want. Okay. Getting data from external sources. So again, we can read data from external places, either CSV files or places in the internet. For instance, I'm reading here a CSV file located at this URL, and the function I'm using is raw read dot csv parenthesis and then between quotation marks because it's a string the url all the file name i want to read so i ask for the structure of the data that's the information about it i can get the column names or the names of the data it's the same thing in this case and you will see what the kind of data is stored there just wanted to let you know this is possible okay one final thing many of you may be working in excel I hope that after the course or during the course, you migrate all your data analysis techniques from Excel to R. And there are several reasons why you will want to do that. We're going to discuss some of them later on. But one of the things that you can do is use an external package. Uh, there are a couple of them, actually, that will allow you to read those Excel files. I have this slide more like a teaser for you to know. It's possible to read also Excel data and uh, each of these packages has advantages and disadvantages one of the things that you need to bear in mind is that you can read one 
uh, she won a spreadsheet at the time. But again, it's something because we get this question many, many times, can I import my Excel data into R? And the answer is yes. And you will do it with one of these packages. There is the Excel X package, she data package, Excel connect package. Any of those may work. Excel X is one of the best ones, but it requires to have Shabba running in your computer. So again, if you're interested in that, I will be more than happy uh, to chat with you about that. Okay, and almost at the end. So this is a summary of what we, we covered today. I, I, I know I'm running a little bit out of time, but basically we have seen R as an interpreted language, super power for data analysis and statistics. We recognize the primitive data types and the comp uh, composite data types, vectors, arrays, and lists. Okay, and I have a question, and let me see if I can address that, and we can, we can finish with that. I don't believe so. So the question is, R does not have a pop-up window for the commas like our studio. No, it doesn't. It will pop up your graphic output, but not your, so the commas will show up in your terminal. Um, so it won't show up in a, in a different route. Okay. I will uh, be in the chat for a little bit longer. I'm going to stop um, the, the audio and the video, but if you guys have questions, feel free to write either in the Zoom chat or in the course website chat. I will be looking there for a few more minutes. Please don't forget to, uh, let me, that's the last thing I want to, to show you. Don't forget to complete um, the survey in the course website. So you will see in a second how does it look like. So I'm going to refresh this. That's the course website, by the way. And at the bottom, you will see test. Uh, it's not a test, it's a survey, 